Hello, I'm David Kane, and I appreciate uh, you taking a few moments of your day and uh, learning a little bit about Rodo. Uh, I'm going to be interviewing Nathan Heck, the CEO of Rodo, and I have to be the one of the first to admit that I knew nothing about Rodo until just a little while ago, and, and I don't mean today, but just a few weeks ago. Um, and I realized that there are so many uh, opportunities in the marketplace that are occurring and businesses are starting to percolate that do certain things that are, are really made for the time that we're going through here in the uh, coronavirus crisis. Uh, so what I'd like to do, if you don't mind, Nathan, is have you introduce yourself to the audience and then I'll uh, ask you a few questions and uh, we'll learn a little bit about what Roto can do for our clients. Sure. Thank you, and thanks for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, so my name is Nathan Hecht. Um, I am the founder and CEO of Roto. Um, I am a native New Yorker. Um, I've been a tech entrepreneur for approximately the last 20 years. Um, and I stumbled into automotive technology a few years ago on a personal experience in trying to lease a car. And it's been quite the journey ever since. I can imagine. So obviously it was a great experience uh, getting a car, right? Oh, it was so good that I stopped everything that I was doing in my life, literally, and said, we have to build something amazing for consumers and for dealerships sure. so that the, the match between the two uh, with technology in between is, is really awesome. And hopefully we're, uh, we're at least halfway there. Well, good. So let's talk about the marketplace first. Uh, I'm friends with Chip Perry, the uh, gentleman who created Auto Trader. And one of the early lessons I got from him 20 years ago was uh, you have to proportionally grow your audience or you grow your inventory. And if they get out of balance and you have not enough audience for the inventory, the uh, people who provide the inventory are going to get frustrated. And if you have the audience, but you don't have the inventory, the people who are your audience are going to say, hey, where are the cars? So tell us a little bit about what you've done to uh, proportionally bring that along. I, I think that's a great way to open the conversation. Marketplaces have a chicken and egg problem, yes. or in some cases, too much chicken or too much egg or vice versa. So um, in, our, in our case, I think we're doing a pretty good job in balancing inventory versus consumers. We have, um, at the moment, about 165,000 vehicles on the app, um, spread out to um, approximately 10 core markets of the country, the, big, the biggest cities. Um, and we have about um, nearly 600,000 downloads on the mobile app. Okay. So there's a, there's a good ratio of consumers coming into the app looking, looking for vehicles and inventory. Um, and then on the dealership side, that 160,000 equates to about 1,500 dealerships, uh, give or take. Now that the virus has become a part of our lives in the last few week, uh, weeks, we've seen um, a surge in dealership interest, obviously, mm -hmm. as everyone's talking about digital retailing. We like to call ourselves an e-commerce platform not your typical digital retailing platform, but still as we imagine things starting to move online, dealerships and the rest of the industry have shown an interest more than usual. And the same for consumers as they're stuck at home and they're shopping and really getting through the funnel, quote unquote. Um, there's been a, a, a ton of interest and a, and a surge in users as well. So it's been a, a very interesting time for us. Uh, I can just imagine you being in New York, certainly uh, there's a lot of stories you could share with us, I can just imagine. Yeah. Uh, so obviously there's, there's a lot of uh, benefit to a dealership to have a marketplace that kind of closes the deal. Uh, if I can roll the tape back 20 years to when we launched Ford Direct, and I was a founder and uh, chief operating officer of Ford Direct, and we back then created the first digital retailing platform, which was uh, supported with uh, all the visuals we had the commercials and everything was uh, you can go online shop in your pajamas you can uh, price a car finance the car get your trade appraised and all that other <clears throat> it was great and and we assembled our business development team and they were interacting with customers the trouble was customers didn't want to do it then 
Uh, nowadays, customers are checking out their own groceries. Uh, they're going uh, and, and getting into cars with strangers. You know, the world has changed so dramatically over this time. And even our clients, you know, when we talk about digital retailing, they, they are kind of getting into that groove. Uh, the real accelerator, obviously, is this current crisis where you can't have physical contact and, and uh, you can't have people coming through the tr traditional methods. Fortunately for us, because we've been doing this for a long time, our clients are, this is their time to shine, right? They can do that. But in your situation, you're unlike digital retailing that uh, normally it's a uh, add-on to a website um, or you know you work with a business development center that's outsourced. In your case, you're like if AutoTrader or uh, Cars.com or CarGurus sold the car for us. Uh, tell us the difference in those models and what's a lot like what what customers are used to and what's different about the Roto platform. Sure. Um, and I think just to your point, I'll start with timing is everything. And obviously there's been a ton of iterations in digital retailing over the years and everybody sort of thought they have it, they had it right. Um, but the timing was sort of off. There was a mismatch between what the consumer actually wanted, what the dealership was willing to do and the technology itself. The two, the two key differentiators between us and what has happened in the past and what is also happening now around digital retailing is two things. Number one, we put an emphasis on price, meaning monthly payments. Yes. In my personal experience in, in shopping for a car and how this business was born, I saw an ad and I thought that the price that I saw in the ad was the price that you actually pay when you go to the dealership. Sure. And you quickly find out um, as an uneducated American consumer that there are terms and conditions associated with the advertised price. Mm -hmm. And to me, that was, it, it just didn't sit well. Like in everything else that we see, when you see a price of $299, it's $299, maybe plus tax, but that's the extent of it. Mm -hmm. And in a car advertisement, it's subject to your tax. It's subject to the rebates and incentives that you qualify for. It's subject to your credit here and so on and so forth. So when we started this business, we wanted to put an emphasis on what you see is what you pay. So when a consumer comes into Roto and they see a Honda Accord EX, you know, whatever it might be, what they're seeing is a monthly payment and a do it signing that is pre-calculated specific to them, specific to the VIN, specific to the dealership, specific to all the rebates and incentives automatically calculated. And when they place the order for it, it's a, a simple e-commerce transaction. Get your credit approval, upload your, upload your insurance, and have the car delivered to you. And that speaks to the second thing that we focused on, which is you're not a lead when you come onto the Roto platform. By the time your deal gets to the dealership, it's a completed lease transaction. You're uploading your driver's license through the app, your credit is done through the app, your insurance is done through the app, and the vehicle gets delivered to you similar to the way you would do it anywhere else online. So two key factors. Number one, the price payment. And number two, the ability to have the feeling of I am completing the transaction online versus other digital retailers where eventually you still end up in BDC or you still end up ultimately coming to the showroom. And then the dealer has the opportunity to do whatever he or she does once you're at the showroom. So that's how we differentiate ourselves. And frankly, we think that's what's different between us and everything else that's out there today. And the history of, of sort of what's been offered before. And we hope that the masses will start to consider doing, even though this is a high ticket item, same way they've done it with real estate, same way they've done it with other things where eventually the trend moved online, jewelry, high-end jewelry in some cases, art or what have you, that they'll be comfortable enough to do this transaction in mass online. Well, so obviously I am a, a fan of this level of simplicity and, and at the end of the day, uh, putting the consumer and the dealer in a uh, comfortable position as opposed to adversarial. And if, if you look at some of the advertisement with early startups, uh, one of the first things that they try to do is to uh, disassociate with the dealership. And, and I can certainly understand that. My father became a dealer in 1952 and I, along with my eight siblings, were raised in the family business. 
And it's all I know, it's, it's what I've done after I graduated from college. I, I started working at the dealership, spent 20 years in automotive retail. And so I've got a high appreciation for what people think of car dealers. And now we've spent the last 17 years in this business helping dealerships uh, provide that level of customer difference. And, and I think, uh, you know, something I've read a lot of, on recently is uh, experience is the new brand. And I think there's so much truth to that. And if, if you have your uh, success story, which, which I fully believe you're, you're well on the path to do that, this experience is going to be your brand. And, uh, you know, hopefully one day people will say, yeah, I rode that car. And, uh, and dealers will say, yeah, we, we road uh, our, our that much inventory. And, and, if, and if we think in terms of your relationship with the dealership, things have to be beneficial to both parties. Um, so if I'm the consumer, and now I've got two, two facilitators of this relationship, who owns the relationship with the customer, and uh, is it gonna cost the customer more money and, and um, so we'll, I'll pause there and then I want to follow that up with what's the cost for dealer participation versus what if they were to do it on their own. So we'll stick with the consumer. Sure. So to, uh, your first question to answer directly, who owns the consumer? We share the consumer with the dealership. So in our dealer agreement, very short, straight to the point agreement, the dealer, uh, once the transaction is transferred to the dealer to complete, the dealer owns that customer together with us. They can retarget that customer. Um, they can sell F&I to that customer. That customer belongs to them for service and so on and so forth. But when the lease and soon finance coming in the next couple of weeks is expired, we expect that we will retarget that customer as well simultaneously. It's a bit of a of a of an iffy area still in that the consumer will be retargeted by both. But when we looked at other marketplaces. Um, when you look at travel marketplaces, Expedia, as an example, you, um, you bought the ticket from American Airlines technically through Expedia, you're going to get your email from American Airlines, you're going to get your email from Expedia. To your earlier point about the experience, if the consumer has an amazing experience, the path will ultimately find itself in the right direction. So that's as far as ownership of the consumer. Um, the, as far as the dealership is concerned, um, from their perspective, we only charge the dealership a fee once the, the deal is consummated. We have some SaaS or premium software that we offer dealerships, but the basic roto to list your vehicles, to get leases, um, and so on and so forth is absolutely free to the dealership. It, it's nothing to sign up. And then um, uh, uh, you know, once, the, once they are actually start to get leases, upon a lease consummation, they get billed from us. And the other thing that I'll add to that, um, which is very important, is anything that the dealer can sell the consumer in the store, they can sell on our app. Any interaction that they can have with the consumer at the store, they can have on the app or outside of the app once the dealer, once the consumer has been handed off to them and so on and so forth. So sometimes dealers say, well, you know, what about my F&I and what about my add-ons and what about, you know, what if they need a co-signer? All of these sort of things where dealerships are afraid, hey, can I do that online? On Roto, they can certainly do it. Okay, so if you look in the uh, back end of TrueCar, to a large degree, uh, a lot of that can be perpetuated by the dealership. And yet at the same time, um, most dealerships wanna run through their traditional structure. In your early iteration, so is this something where you're seeing dealerships are using um, traditional salespeople, business development team members, or is this primarily through sales management and finance management? So p part of our pitch, if you will, to dealerships is that this, this will be your, your fastest, easiest, cheapest transaction. And the way the system works is, I'll explain, the consumer, when they place an order and they've uploaded their documents, at that point in time, the vehicle that that car, that the dealership that that vehicle is coming from, the contact person at the store who handles the roto transactions will get a notification that says, hey, you have a new lease. 
you have a few hours to process. They click on it and it's a push notification to their cell phone. It opens up the lease information on our dashboard. Simultaneously, if the dealership wishes, we can send it to their CRM as well. And that's pretty much the extent of it. Um, in addition to that, actually, if the dealership wishes for the credit application to go directly into their dealer track and so on and so forth, we of course accommodate for that also. But it doesn't get lost in the BDC department where BDC is calling the customer and trying to get them into the store and so on and so forth. So it's a literally a virtual customer. If, as if the customer came into the store and a salesperson ultimately greeted them, brought them to a desk, that's the same thing. They get everything pushed to them as if the customer was sitting there, except it's completed. It's post-negotiation, if you will. The price is there, the VIN is there, the customer's information is there, credit's there, everything is there, and the dealership takes that keys everything in and completes the transaction. So we think it's extremely light because of how few people actually touch it. And we often tell dealers on, a, on the Roto dashboard, you set your pricing of where you want your vehicles to be sold above or below invoice. We'll handle the calculation after that. We can't reset sort of where the market is on front end pricing for vehicles today in North America. We're, everybody knows some markets you're selling behind invoice, some you're selling at, some you're selling above, and so on and so forth. That's not a problem that we believe we can fix, if it is a problem at all at the moment. What we can do is we can bring your costs down dramatically on how many people need to touch a transaction so that you're happy to pay us our fee because net-net, it is still a very profitable transaction where there's a ton of gross. Okay, so a lot of things percolate in my mind. Uh... So the model seems brokerish, but not necessarily a broker. Uh, it's, if you're familiar with uh, big volume leasing companies like Peterson, Hal and Heather, our dealership did a lot of courtesy deliveries uh, where we didn't participate in any of that, but we did handle the PDI and uh, got a, a small fee for, for that. Going back to the ownership of this customer, if I'm the OEM, is this a transaction where I punch the sales ticket through my dealership and then I show that traditional ownership cycle? Is my finance company someone that I know that I'm financing or is the consumer financing with Rodo? Right. So the consumer, uh, the dealership is doing it as if they own the customer from beginning to end from the dealership, the OEM, and the lender perspective. Um, you know, you, it's, it's funny, you mentioned brokerish. Uh, to some extent, if you look back at the travel industry, just because we're on that example um, throughout this conversation, um, you know, 15, 20 years ago, when you needed to fly to Europe, you called the travel agent to get a ticket. Yes. And they were a broker of sorts in those days. Um, and today, obviously, you go on a website, you can argue that they are a broker of sorts. Um, in the traditional automotive uh, um, definition of broker, we know we're definitely not. But of course, there are some similarities in that we are handing off a customer to a dealer, but we still hold on to that customer, um, you know, ever so slightly. So in that sense, I understand where you're coming from. Um, but I think um, from, from, you know, the transactions that we've done over the last few years, um, the dealership does it as if they've acquired the customer customer came into the store and it belongs to the customer, albeit in this case, it's coming through uh, an online platform. Okay, so uh, let's talk about if, if you're willing to reveal what kind of a cost structure is involved for the dealership. Sure, so uh, we're at a fixed cost right now per delivered vehicle of $399 per delivered vehicle. Mm -hmm. And if I can add to that, most dealers look at it sort of in their, um, and. I would say most, but then there are others that sort of, there are co-op dollar, you know, opportunities and stuff like that. But most say, look, if I'm going to sell my car at a, you know, a thousand above invoice, now it's going to be 1400 above invoice so that I have the $400 cushion, uh, you know, to pay Roto for their fee and so on and so forth. There is a percentage of dealers that look at it slightly different, but usually that's sort of the way it's perceived. Okay. And as a dealer, they set their pricing on the platform. So if I've got a spectrum of, let's just pick a Toyota Camry, which is a, a good mass market car. Uh, I could be dealer A at, let's say $1,400 over and dealer B is $1,000 over. 
the consumer is going to see the exact same window sticker, same equipment. Uh, but you as Roto are basically saying, I don't care what you price the vehicle. Are you going to give guidance a la car gurus, good deal, great deal, whatever, or? Okay, so uh, good question. I knew car gurus was, had to come up <laughs> at yeah. some point. Yeah. Um, so at the moment for the consumer, we are not highlighting good deal, great deal, or otherwise. We yeah. are allowing them to figure it out on their own. Okay. That said, I will add, this algorithm has been a machine that's been learning over a few years now. And it has gotten very smart in the background in, in which vehicles to show consumers at what time um, and so on and so forth. And we think that we're doing a, a pretty good job in balancing, making sure that dealership inventory for the right reasons is getting in front of consumers front and center and the same for, from a consumer perspective to make sure that customers are seeing the right cars and so on and so forth. We're testing a few different things as the industry evolves, but we're certainly not saying, oh, price, 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 great deal, grab this one. The only thing, the only area on the app where we make an emphasis of price or payment for lack of, uh, is um, we do have a best deal section and we give dealerships an opportunity on our dashboard also to highlight those vehicles and push those vehicles Maybe they're aged inventory. Maybe they're cars that haven't moved. Um, maybe there's a great incentive on those cars or some behind the scenes money that dealers have for that vehicle. Therefore, they can you know, highlight it to the consumer and so on and so forth. And that's our best deal section. But in our ordinary search, it's all algorithmically based. Um, and as I mentioned, the details of how it shows up. Okay, so let's talk about um, a mover and shaker in the industry uh, who's in your general vicinity, Paragon Honda. Uh, Paragon Acura. Are they a participant in your program? Um, interestingly enough, they are not. Almost all of their competitors of high volume in the New York tri-state are. Okay, so let's let's think. I want you to think in terms of your favorite customer and and why they're your favorite customer. Were they the first one? Were they the ones you've really engineered a lot based on their feedback? Tell us a little bit about what your favorite dealer customer looks like? What are the attributes? Absolutely. The, the number one attribute is a dealership that, that bought in. Meaning if it's, a, if, it's a, if it's a medium or small group, one to five stores, owner principles. Do you believe that this is an avenue for you to acquire customers and to en enhance and build your business over the near and long term? And if yes, have you explained that to management just below you, your GMs, your GSMs, your SMs, and so on and so forth? And our dream customer are the dealer groups um, that have brought in for, at the highest level. If we have plenty of the, of the top 10, top 20, top 30 groups, where you know the publics, the nationals, and so on and so forth, where they are trickling down into their stores and telling them, this is a part of our business. And then we have, as I mentioned, some of the smaller regionals and so on and so forth, a very good mix. And, and what we found is, is that when there's buy-in from the top and then it trickles down throughout at the store level, it is, it is such an unbelievable experience for the store and for the consumer. Literally, I don't have the words to describe how unbelievable of a new car buying experience this is when you have that buy-in from the dealership and then the consumer gets exactly what they're expecting. And then it moves south sort of from there. Yes, we want it. Um, we'll get to it when we can. Okay, we see the order. We'll handle it this afternoon and so on and so forth. And it starts to break down. And for us, I think we do a good job also. We spoke about that algorithm a minute ago of how cars list and so on and so forth. That's one of the components that goes into the algorithm. We have a simple scoring methodology. If you are a dealer that got 20 transactions this month and you shipped you know, 16 to, to 20 of those, you're going to rank higher. If you shipped eight of those 20, you're, you're probably gonna be ranking very low and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of things that go into that. Um, and that gives you a little bit of an insight of what our dream customer might be. Okay, good. So I know that when we launched Ford Direct, we did the, the smile, 
and I'd never heard of the smile being from uh, the, you know, the southeast Midwest area in Kentucky. Um, we learned about, you know, the New York all the way down to Florida and then across the high population areas. So where are you in the smile? Are you all the way through? It's amazing because we literally cover the smile with a few breaks along the south. So the New York, we, we're, we're, we're from Boston all the way through Philadelphia on the East Coast. Heavy emphasis on the New York tri-state, obviously huge volume, but Boston is a big, important market. When I say Boston, I mean Boston in a hundred mile radius around it and so on and so forth. And we even have some dealers in New Hampshire, Rhode Island, Maine, and so on and so forth into Philly. Um, we just launched parts of the Carolinas, actually. Atlanta, Georgia just went live for us a few weeks ago. And then we go down all the way through the coast in Florida, both coasts of Florida, Fort Lauderdale, Miami, and then back up. Tampa, Orlando. So we have really good dealer coverage in, in, in all of those areas. Then along the coast, it starts to break up. Uh, it, it restarts again in Texas. And then uh, Nevada and coming back up into California is a huge market for us also, especially Southern California, you know, San Diego coming up through the Los Angeles basin and north and so on and so forth. And then in the Midwest, Chicago, Ohio, and Indiana have been very good markets for us. And those are really our core markets that I just mentioned. And now we're sort of adding as the interest comes in, we're starting to add and, and fill the blanks. Sure. So I live in uh, Oakland, California now. So uh, when I go to search, where do I find Roto? If I'm so you'll see, so you're in Northern California, you'll see um, not as much robust make, uh, you know, uh, inventory makes and models as you would, for example, if you were in California, but that's actually a great example. And also as you move sort of into the Valley in San Francisco, obviously a lot of those dealerships are still shut down. Some of the larger groups are still shut down. So your inventory might be even further limited for those reasons, but we do have stores up in San Francisco and some going into Oakland and so on and so forth. And we'll put a bigger emphasis now as that is that part of the, the state starts to come back online. We've already seen some interest in dealers in that area. So I think in the next few weeks, as you uh, start to search inventory, you'll start to see a little bit more robust. Excellent. Nathan, it's been fun. Uh, I love your enthusiasm for your product. Uh, and, and I think as you were sharing that story, it's just wonderful when all that comes together. Uh, I think more importantly, you're able to give people something that you wanted them to have. And I think that's the, the real key of a successful entrepreneur. And, and I look forward to learning more about your all's future and seeing how our dealers can benefit from it. So thank you very much for your time today. My pleasure. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it.